Uh, welcome to this edition of the 336. This is our first video blog entry, and we are excited to have Laura Deming with us here this week. Um, Laura is the founder of the Longevity Fund. They're looking to disrupt the aging process, or as Laura said in, in her SciTech lecture for SciTech this morning, allowing everyone on the planet to decide how long they want to live, which is a pretty big goal. So thanks for being with us, Laura. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let me tell you a little bit about, about Laura, because she's uh, just a little impressive. Um, she started working in a lab at, you said 11 this morning, right? Or 12? Uh, 12. OK. Yeah. So I, when I was 12, I was mowing lawns. So <laughs> a little difference there. Um, enrolled at MIT at 14. Yep. Dropped out at 17? Uh, 16, yeah. 16, because who needs MIT? And uh, won her Peter, Peter Thiel Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Started your fund. Uh, and now runs a 23, 27 million dollar fund? Yeah, 27? exactly, we have 27 AUM. That's awesome. So this is our first time in Winston-Salem, and we are delighted <laughs> to sit down with you. You're gonna do the double red eye, so we're gonna get you back to the airport. Yeah, uh, thank you so time. much for having me. Absolutely. So how do you introduce yourself? That is a, that's a pretty impressive way to <laughs> go through life. Like, what do you say, I'm Laura Dimming, I? Um, I'm a venture investor interested in making people live longer. You're so young, like people have been asking me, like how, what's the interest in aging? Like what does a 23 year old mm. know about aging yet? I'm like, I don't know, I'm gonna ask her. Oh, interesting. You know, I think actually as a young person, um, aging can be a more easy thing for you to spend a lot of time contemplating because it's so far away. So mm. I feel that if I were 70 or 80, I would have trouble doing what I'm doing now because I'd always have to think about something that's possibly gonna happen to me and that's a mm, bad thing interesting. in the next decade or so, whereas I have a lot of removal right now, at least hopefully from my eventual demise, if and when it happens. <laughs> Let's and hope so, so. Right, it's, I think it's easier psychologically to be interested yeah. in the problem from a scientific perspective than it would be if I were uh, closer in age to it. So what do you think we're gonna see in the next 20, 30 years in, in longevity research and commercialization of products? So two things. I think you're going to see on-market products that are making people live longer, but a short amount, so maybe a couple of years max. Mm -hmm. um, a decade would be wonderful, but I don't know if we're going to get there. I think at the same time, you're also going to see an explosion of technologies in all aspects of biotech. And I think some of those are going to allow for uh, breakthroughs that we currently can't anticipate yeah. that will possibly add decades or more to human life. Um, you know, I can't say when or how or where it's well, going to sure, happen, yeah. but that's, I think, the, the hope on the kind of grander scale. While in the meantime, we're kind of working incrementally towards these small improvements to start getting some therapies out there. I know aging is sort of a cluster <laughs> of things, but yeah. where do you think we're making the greatest advances? Uh, so to me, I think the biggest advance is getting any therapeutic into humans that controls longevity. I think mm -hmm. that that's the big, like that, that that's our shining gold goal. And um, once we do that, I think the pharma industry in general uh, will be catalyzed to move in this direction. You'll see a variety of research, but just achieving that mm -hmm. is absolutely what we're focused on right now. So one of the things that we're trying to do here in, in the Piedmont Triad and, and at Venture Cafe in particular is we're trying to encourage people to, to be more comfortable with risk. I heard you say something really amazing this morning, which was, you know, you, you get $100,000 at age 16, you move to California, and you said, I don't know how to do this, but I'm gonna say yes. What, how, how have you embraced risk in your life, and what would you say are some things that would help some other people become a little more comfortable with risk? Yeah, I think at that time, accepting the th chance of failure was a big part of it. So if you say to yourself, well, the probability of failure is like 80% or something, but I'm gonna do it anyway, and so I can plan, you know, if I fail, yeah. then I'll, I'm fine with that. Um, but if I succeed, then that's an upside. Um, I think that helps a lot. And also, um, I think being all in. So I think that if I had you know, stayed in school or kind of partially tried to work on the fund, it would have been very hard to get past that first hurdle. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're out in California and you're um, you know, hypothetically a promising young person, but you don't have anything to show for it, and right. you're spending two years trying to make this thing happen, if you don't make that thing happen, you really do feel it. And, and so I think those two things, accepting failure, and being very all in onto what you're doing, um, at least for me, were helpful in addressing and mitigating the risk. So one of the other things that um, we're also trying to do is encourage people to uh, pursue self-learning, right? So what are some of the ways that you are feeding your curiosity? How do you mm, keep yourself yeah. sharp? Um, Not that I think you need a lot of help, <laughs> so. Uh, well, it's a 
Fantastic question. I think, um, uh, so I, I'm a very curious person and uh, I learn a lot of things um, just out of interest. Uh, but I think one of the fascinating things has been how helpful that's been unexpectedly. Mm. So um, for example, there's been a rise of companies looking at the intersection of computation and biology. And um, that's an area that I happen to have read and learned a little bit about the past couple of years, just because a lot of my friends are in the area and they're extremely erudite, and so I love to talk to them. And it's actually been very helpful to have that cross-disciplinary understanding where I couldn't program something uh, very effectively right now, but I could tell you generally if somebody knows what they're talking about when they're first certain concepts. And so um, I think to that you have a community that can help you kind of by osmosis just get a little bit of information about new areas. It's, it's insanely helpful in a way that's not obvious at the start. So one of the um, one of the things that I get asked about a lot are what are some of the most helpful tools and skills to spark innovation. So do you have any sort of resources or skill sets that you mm. rely on if you're facing that <laughs> like like that big hairy naughty problem? Right. Do you say I'm going to look at this from a design thinking way, or I'm going to think about it this way, or approach it this way? You know that's fun. Um, I, so if I if I try to think about okay, well if I have a problem, how do I think outside the box? Normally it's talk to uh, people that I trust. So I think friends are a great source of ideas. Typically, a conversation with somebody who works in um, you know agriculture will give me a, a thought on the problem that I didn't have previously, or trying cool. to explain to them what my thinking is and having to reduce it down to that level is super helpful. Yeah, um, that's probably the main one. Nice. So those unexpected connections. Exactly. Yeah, those are the same things that we're trying to to. to those collisions, we like to call them mm. creative collisions. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so we, we're trying to get you know scientists combining with artists and inventors and, and investors and trying to just bring everybody together around that. We have a hunch, right? And there's, of course, a really great Brookings study that says digitalization, all jobs, all sectors, all levels now require a greater level of, of technology, of understanding, of deep mm. learning, right? So. The good part about that is, great, more productivity, bigger profits, more resilient economies. But the dark side of that is it leaves people behind, right? And I heard you say something this morning about, you know, it needs to be accessible to everybody. Right. So when you start thinking about aging, right, how is that inclusivity important? How is that diversity important in the conversation? Mm, interesting. So I think on, on your prior point, I'd actually push back a bit. I think technology tends to, at least if you look at the numbers, um, you know, increase employment in general. I think uh, the, at least the correlation between technical progress and uh, employment metrics is, is actually quite positive. Um, so I'm not sure that it it leaves uh, people behind like by, like numerically. Um, I, I think that the aging question is a really important one, right? We like our goal as a fund is that everyone in the world has the ability to choose how long they want to live. Yeah. Um, Which is a radically simple but profoundly disruptive idea. Right. Right. Because um, it's not saying we want to make sure you live forever. It's saying we can't proclaim to you what your how to live your life, but you should be on the same level as everybody else when it comes to making that decision. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, you know statins are a great example of a drug that is widely it's sort of a you know something that we want to emulate in the sense that I think sure. anybody who wants a statin can take one. Yeah. Um, and they're preventative and, and wide use. But you know, I, my my hope is that the technology won't that we first develop for this. Uh, won't won't be so expensive that it we, we, we can't immediately get it to everyone. If, if that's the case, then I, I have hope that incrementally we can start to open that up and that the early adopters will fund the uh, eventual yeah. kind of democratization of the technology. But I think it is something that's really important to keep in mind from the start that, that that's your eventual goal. Yeah, the democratization is the key word there. So my last question is, what is Laura Deming going to be doing at age forty six? Oh, I love that. Well. Um, if we've made significant strides along the path that uh, I'm interested in working in, then I would love to be a monk in the mountains doing math all the time. Wow. I think that'd be amazing. Wow. Um, I think that if we're, like, if things are about the same as they are now, so there's a chance, right, that in the next couple of decades we don't make great strides. Sure. We're kind of in the 1980s in terms of Turing oncology, and we're, you know, moving up to now where we still have Turing oncology, in which case, um, probably still care about this enough to be working in the space. but. Um, I, I think it's an amazing time. I think it's, it's the most fun place you could possibly work. So, so I want to hear about this monk in the mountain doing math. Like, what kind of math, oh, uh, what kind of math makes like lights you up? Uh, well, I'm, so to be clear, I'm not good at math. I just enjoy thinking about things abstractly, yeah. and so math's yeah. kind of uh, one way to do that. And um, 
yeah, you know, I, I think just uh, I'd love to get up every day and just like take out a book on uh, some random subject and just spend some time trying to make shapes my mind fit or That's get awesome. maps to work. Yeah. That's very cool. That's very cool. Well, that wraps up our 336 blog for this week. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank it's you very been a much. real pleasure. This has been uh, a great conversation.